I gotta say, I've been treated so nicely here. I mean, just so nicely. Everybody in the design lab is really nice. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the warmth in the air which people display towards each other is just totally fabulous. Not that we don't do that at MIT, you know, <laughs> hey, but still. So, um, yeah, I've been at this a while, and uh, my goal, really, uh, sort of the, the, the moral purpose or whatever, is I am trying to empower people. I'm trying to build systems and make clear how systems work that we all can participate in, sort of democratized innovation. And what I'm going to tell you about is, you know what? It's getting stronger and stronger. The tools that individuals have are better and better. The collaboration mechanisms that people have are better and better. And so I'll give you a couple of examples about how this is going in the right direction from my perspective. You know? So we really have to transfer some of this innovation power to people. And uh, one of the things I'll be talking about in, in, uh, on, I guess, Friday, tomorrow, right? Uh, in, the, uh, in the diabetes conference, which is downtown in uh, San Diego, is, is how people are getting empowered to, to build their own, uh, their own medical devices and so on. And, and you know, we're s trying to set up a complete grassroots innovation system. And Don is thinking of similar things. And, you know, to, to sort of, rather than say, how do we get patient input to companies so that, gee, please pay attention, it's more like, how do we fully empower patients to clinically test their own innovations in terms of trials and all the rest of it and create an alternative grassroots system? So in the spirit of all that, this free innovation and all my other books are uh, free on the web. I mean, MIT sells physical copies. And I had this marvelous process of trying to convince them that they would surely sell more if they gave them all away. You know, you make it up in volume. And uh, they're very nice about it, so that worked out. But you can get free downloads, and that would be great. So here's the context. Here's the situation. Basically, as we work on this process of the democratization of innovation, what's happening is we are working against an entrenched system of producer innovation. Everybody assumes that producers are the source of innovation. And therefore, all the mechanisms in place, patents and everything else, are oriented towards producers. So it's almost like you have to make this clear, and then you will see that we can start to rebuild these systems. So I'll explain that as I go along. So the first thing you should know, those of you who are not in economics, is that the assumption in economics is that the producer is the innovator. Consumers consume. That's it. And in the early, earlier times of Schumpeter, who was at the core of this, here he is in one of his more cheerful moods, um, it's, it's, uh, he said, well, it's the producer who initiates economic change, and consumers are educated by him as necessary. He didn't really even think that you might have your own needs. It was sort of like the, the, the entrepreneur and the, and, the, and the producer decided what you wanted. So. That's the situation, and that is what policy has been built around. So I'll talk to you about free user innovations, and they don't even appear in the statistics. I'll talk to you about the fact that users do all sorts of amazing things, but the way that the measures in the government are built is that an innovation is not an innovation until it's on the market. So if you invent something that's totally fabulous and it diffuses widely, it doesn't get counted until somebody sells it. And then it gets attributed to the company that sold it. And then everybody turns around and says, see, look at our innovation system. Producer-based is working like a charm, right? So what we've been doing is sort of working to disentangle all this. Now, all right, so here's the standard system. It has no place in it for user innovation, consumers. Market research is done, research and development are done, production, market diffusion, all people being paid, 
you get your money back by selling stuff and intellectual property like patents protects you so that you can get profits. That's the deal. So I didn't, and colleagues of mine, we didn't believe this. You know, it's like, really? I said, yeah, really. Really? Have you ever looked? Well, no, there's no need to look. So, oh. So we managed to persuade, uh, it was so cool, uh, in the UK. The UK is really nice about things somehow. But in the UK, we couldn't persuade NSF. NSF is now doing it. But in, in, in the earlier days of this, which was about 2011, in the UK, they said, well, you know, Eric, you've been talking about this stupid thing with your colleagues for quite a while. And it's worth a hundred thousand pounds to prove you wrong. I thought, hey, I'll take it. So what we did was, with colleagues, we set up a national representative survey, a sample that was nationally representative, which, which, which you all know about, but which means basically that if a certain proportion of the country is technically educated, so is a certain proportion of the sample. Now, we then went out and we measured very carefully, and we measured in a way, we asked consumers, did you innovate? Did you, within the last three years, make a product which was better than something that could be on the market to serve your own needs? And, you know, people don't know what innovation is, so what you have to do is you have to do a telephone survey and you have to say to them, well, this is what it is, and then did you do something like that? And then they say, oh yes, my house burned down and I rebuilt it. We say, no, that's not an innovation. Here's what it has to be. It has to be something that isn't on the market. It has to be something that's better than what's on the market, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, we really winnowed this thing down to hardcore, real innovations. And what we found was that 6.1% of the population innovated. Now this is really important because, number one, it's totally hidden. Nobody ever measured this before. Number two, it's huge. So as an example, there are 2.9 million people who innovate in the UK. That's the 6.1%. There are only 22,000 people in the UK that companies employ to develop products for consumers. In other words, this hidden area of innovation is a hundred times larger than what is being measured in terms of the number of people part-time engaged, but passionately engaged very often. The, the consumer spending is very high, 5.2 billion a year. We have now done nine countries, and we're doing China now, and hundreds of millions of people are gonna be engaged in this around the world. If we project out the numbers, we've got now tens of millions, spending tens of billions in just six countries. As we project it out, it's going to be hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Okay, so that's huge. Now what about it? Well, first thing, is that you will see it around. Increasingly, you see it around. So here is an example. I used it this morning in the design lab. Uh, individuals in the household sector, they consumers, they innovate. Now, this is a suitcase with an electric motor. Now, we are all, as I mentioned this morning, so proud that we have a suitcase with wheels. Whoa, we can pull it. We are so proud. Oh. But this guy said, well, why shouldn't it pull me? And so he basically integrated an electric scooter with a thing, and then uh, he proudly said that he could go 20 kilometers on it, on a charge, which is about the, the ex from my walking, is about the extent of an average airport in China. And here we have immediately commercialization. But nobody in this company commercializing it mentions this guy at all. You know, it's we have created the moto bag and it's marvelous. Now, consumers innovate in all areas of value to them. About 70% of the GDP in, in advanced countries is devoted to end use consumption of services and products. So it's crafts and shop tools, it's sports and hobbies, it's dwelling related, it's gardening related, it's child related, vehicle related, pet related, medical, computer software, food and clothes, and so forth. 
So it's every area you can imagine, and it maps very well on the time that people spend in these different activities. If they care a lot about their gardens, they might well innovate in terms of their gardens. Now, uh, my daughter, Christiana, here. <laughs> I'm a proud father. She's, she's a PhD student at uh, Harvard looking at this stuff. And, and uh, here you see medical, uh, medical, the fraction of the overall uh, user activity that's uh, um, uh, medical related. And then when you, when you convert that into numbers, like in the US, that's almost 400,000 people. That's many more than there are developers in the kinds of, of medical equipment companies that we have over here. These are developers typically of medical uh, kinds of equipment. Christiana's looking at behaviors, how people help themselves with respect to uh, medical problems. So an example that's very impressive, and Don knows about it, uh, is, is, and Don is now working related to this, Don Norman this is, uh, is about, about um, um, the artificial pancreas. So if you have uh, uh, diabetes, type 1 diabetes, what you can buy nowadays is a continuous blood glucose measuring device, and you can buy an insulin pump, but the thing in the middle that does all the calculations, you can't buy. Now, the, the person, Dana, who, who actually uh, uh, built the first artificial pancreas for herself, did it because she fell asleep and she was afraid to fall asleep. She fell asleep and one of the things that is really worrisome for type 1 diabetics is that you might go into a coma when you're asleep. So you put a juice box right by your bed and she put a juice box by her bed but she woke up too late and so she couldn't move her muscles to get the juice box. She could see the juice box, but she couldn't reach it. And so Scott saved her. And then she was afraid to go to sleep. Now, she and her husband are programmers. This is a programming issue. In other words, what you do as a diabetic is you do all these per hand calculations. You say, well, I'm going to go running, and then I'm going to eat this many carbs, and so therefore I have to put in this much insulin, and so on. It's very computation intensive. But on the other hand, it's something that you can automate because you know your own behaviors. So she built one of these things, and I can show you a picture. And this was the first one, and she immediately began to wear it. And what happened then was that her numbers, you know, you're supposed to keep your blood sugar in a certain range. She never was out of range at night again. And her numbers during the day were much better. You know, she was just much more spot on. So this was amazing. So what did she do about it? Well, she and Scott posted it on the web. Now remember, I'm talking here about a grassroots innovation system. There was no, is no still, there's about to be, there is no commercial artificial pancreas. But she posted the design on the web because everybody really needed it. And what the companies were telling them is, hey, look, in five years, we'll have it for you. And they're saying, A, I might die, and B, you've been saying that for the last 20 years, right? Now, the companies are not enormously to blame because, in fact, the FDA regulates them. And in this case, individuals who innovate for themselves are not regulated. You can do anything you want to treat yourself. Medically, you can build any devices. You are protected by privacy rights and other rights. You can just do it. You can treat yourself. You can post on the web what you have done. Others can download what you've done and build their own copy. And all of them have no legal or regulatory constraint. They have legal constraints in the sense that you can't hurt others, but they have no regulatory constraint. The FDA has nothing to do with it. So here you see this contrast between this highly regulated industry 
and this totally free situation where you have citizens who can innovate, who have the capability to innovate, increasingly because they have the design tools, they have the ability to share. And so our thought is, and many others share this thought, I'm sure Don and others in his lab do, our thought is, wait a minute now, we shouldn't try to get the patients to integrate with the companies so that the companies may or may not pay attention, right? Co-design, you must pay attention to your patients, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why shouldn't we instead fully tool up those patients so that they can not only exchange information, but we can build uh, uh, sort of clinical trial software, N of one trials and, and shared public databases with anonymous, anonymization and so on? So that what you're really doing, instead of saying, oh, gee, we ought to do something to the FDA so that they treat the companies better so that we can get this stuff through faster, it's no, we've got this fabulous, fabulous free innovation system that's building, empowering capability. So now the story here is that what happened was, again, this thing is the commercial version, it's not out yet. This is the current 2017 version of the uh, free device. So they posted the information on the, on the web. Anybody can buy these pieces and put it together. By now, there are a couple hundred people, remember this is before there's any commercial device, using these artificial pancreases day and night. They have collectively accumulated a million hours of use. The Medtronics trial that Medtronics had to pay a bunch of money to do is basically only 140,000 hours of patient data. The patient information, that is the code here, is open and free and therefore repairable in an open source way. The code here is closed. The code here is a few hundred lines. The code here is thousands of lines. So it's something really quite fabulous to think about. Now, if we systematize this, what we see is we have a new innovation system. I showed you earlier that it's really powerful in terms of the number of people being active. When you look at its operating principles, it's quite different, but it does interact with the producer one. So you remember this producer one, it's marketing, research, R&D, and production, and so forth. What we have here is something more akin to open source. What we have is self-rewarded user development. Now, I'll explain that to you, but the idea is that nobody has to pay these people to do what they're doing because they're rewarded by their own use or their own fun or their own altruism. So nobody had to pay Dana to save her own life, right? So then you get collaborative evaluation, replication, and improvement, just like in open source. And in this case, the community grew from nothing to hundreds. And basically, the logo, there are two communities now. One of them, uh, the, I love the logo. You must know it, right? The logo of the Night Scout thing, where people built things for their kids, is we're not waiting. I love that logo. It's we are not waiting. And why should they if they can help themselves? All right, and then you have peer-to-peer -peer free diffusion. Now this is enforced in the case of the FDA thing because if it ain't free, if, there's no, if it's not all free, then what happens is all of a sudden the FDA has control over it. So the interesting thing about this top thing, and it's, it's almost enforced in the case of medical, but it's true in general, you'll see, people just give this stuff away. The interesting thing about a top thing is it's transaction free. Nobody pays you to do it. Nobody pays you to buy it from you. That's a really good thing because it then has that open source thing where nobody's trying to sort of say, well, you be sure to pay me my share kind of thing. It's very fast and efficient. The downside is because it has no transactions, it's invisible to economics because economics measures transactions. So as I told you before, what happens is you get innovation designs coming down like this, 
and uh, they're picked up here and then they're credited to companies. You also get innovation support, and I'll go into that. As companies figure out that there's something going on here that's interesting, they end up uh, giving tools. So now I'm going to show you when we measure the types of incentives that use, and Don, by the way, is Don. <laughs> Don told me, Eric, five or ten words per slide. That's it. And I'm so in the red on this, I, I don't know what to do. So what I did in his design lab this morning is, I, I, can I use my Jedi powers again? There are only, you see, only five to ten words. There are only five to ten words on these slides. And then you have to say back to me, the force is strong in this one, right? That's what you have. Okay, so now. When we ask about the incentives, what we get is, well, personal use, about half. Help others, altruism, about 12%. Have fun developing it. When you go down to the basement to work on this thing, you're not saying, oh, shoot, I have to do that again. You're saying, man, this is going to be really fun. And learning from developing it, participation. Only the one thing, sell it, make money, which is about 5% in this sample, is about a transaction. Everything else is self-rewarded, okay? Now, when you break it out by cluster analysis, what you see is that everybody has a mixture of motives, but in fact, over here, we have personal need, 81%. That's about 40% of the sample, 37% of the sample. That's, that's, that's basically where Dana fits, right? She wasn't doing it primarily for fun. She was doing it because she had to do it. And then you have participators. You have a large number of people who are basically saying, this is interesting. This is human flourishing. I love problem solving. I'm doing this. You see it in maker spaces and so on, where they're making stuff that makes no sense whatsoever. There was a marvelous neon fish in the last maker thing I went to. It comes up and sort of looks at you and then goes away. You know, it's fabulous. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then you have helpers. Okay? There are people who are doing it out of altruism. These things are named for the largest motive, and then you have people, about 9% of them, who are motivated by money in the sense that they want to start something in uh, uh, entrepreneurship, right? They'd like to make money from their innovation. So now, when you have a school, I mean, this, this whole emphasis on this piece, you're missing 90% of the story, right? This piece is all about, yes, it's wonderful. We can, we can help students start companies, and we can make entrepreneurship, and we can build Silicon Valley and the rest of it. 90% of it is not about the money. Now, people can come along. These people, they can adopt somebody else's innovation as well as their own and get it out there, or firms can, or whatever. But it's not about the money. And uh, that is very interesting. So again, free innovators do not protect their innovations. Others can adopt them for free. Now, I'm going to kind of come back to these three slides. You would have loved those slides. They were so fabulous, but you missed them. Anyway, so I mentioned to you before that there are interactions between these two arrows. Even though this is invisible to economics, it's invisible in government statistics, in fact, there are interactions. So what are they? Well, the first one, see these two arrows here? The first two interaction is that stuff that users make comes down and is often produced, right? So this is this thing like you build a mountain bike. The information is out there for anyone to take it was a bunch of people who built mountain bikes, and they all built them in their garages, and they had fun, and they built them based on motorcycle brakes and stuff like this. And then a company comes along, and it says, hey, we'll build those too. Now, it's really interesting. Companies hate small and uncertain markets. So when the users first began to take their standard bikes down mountains, like Mount Tamalpais in California, they'd be a wreck at the bottom. You know, Dad gives it to you for Christmas or your mom in the morning, and you take it down, and it's a wreck in the afternoon. 
and you drag it off to the store with the warranty in your hand, and you say, look, it's busted. And they say, what did you do? You say, I rode it down a mountain. They say, you're not supposed to do that. Your warranty is void. And that is a producer's typical contribution to the innovation process. <laughs> so a lot of people have to build this thing, and then they start to say, oh, OK, so we'll start to make this stuff. Now, the studies, the producer's savings from this can be huge. In a study of whitewater kayaking innovation, adopting user designs over 50 years. We, it was so hard to do that study, oh my god. Uh, but anyway, whitewater kayaking. So, so we actually measured what the producers spent in design, and we measured what the users spent in design, and all the rest of that sort of thing. The users were more efficient, it turns out, even though there are thousands of them and the rest of it. And basically, 3.2 times the total money those companies had spent on R&D over 50 years was saved. They saved, their actual effective budget was three times larger than what they showed in their books. They were th looked three times more efficient than they were because they were getting all this free stuff from users. And again, the government says, man, you're good at innovating. Oh, crank up the patents. You must be doing something good. Now, that's one interaction, right? And it's a very important one. The next interaction is really interesting, too. It's free compliments. So how many of you ride a bike? You must all ride a bike, right? There's some of you who don't even bother to raise your hand. But of course I ride a bike, but why should I raise my hand? That's too much work, you know? <laughs> so, fine. So you have a mountain bike here that's now manufactured, and it pays the manufacturer to do that because basically once I've built my mountain bike and I want another one, I don't want to spend another three months in the garage. I'd rather just buy one, economies of scale and production. But a mountain bike is only useful if you know how mountain biking techniques work, right? I mean, what good is a mountain bike unless you can do stuff like that? So manufacturers don't do that. They don't invent techniques. It's invented by the users, just like the bike. But the companies can't make a market out of it. So what happens is, Everybody in the area of, of, of uh, 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 mountain biking tells each other by peer-to-peer -peer diffusion, hey, here's how you do it. No, no, you're not doing that quite right. And, and that's how they learn, by practice, right? So the mountain bike gets more valuable because of these free complements that are being supplied peer-to-peer -peer by the users. And that means that the companies make more money but they don't know about this. They don't put it into their calculations. It's amazing. And by the way, this cycle is not just the original mountain bike thing. This cycle repeats and repeats for every major innovation. So this is a bicycle with a suspension on it. And uh, true to form, I mean, people started doing this instead of just riding down trails. And they would come down and they'd say, man, that hurts, right? And the mountain biking manufacturers say, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't jump. We didn't make it for jumping, for Pete's sake. Your warranty is void, by the way. So the users built suspensions. And then after a while, the companies picked them up. So it's not only the basic innovation, it's all of the smaller innovations that, uh, that follow. Now, what about this? Free innovations compete increase social welfare because basically free innovations can compete with producer products and can force down prices. So when you have like Apache operating OS web server software, uh, it's on 38% of the websites. It makes Microsoft's life a little harder. Microsoft has to price its commercial software uh, and do better on it, but price it lower. So basically, again, a good effect that's invisible economically because there are no transactions, but it's a good effect on the whole system. It competes with producers. And this is, again, what we hope will happen in the case of medical uh, folk and their innovations. Now, finally, uh, those of you who are video gamers, and again, you won't even 
will you confess? I wonder if more people will confess to being video gamers than bikers. Anyway, uh, here we have companies starting to figure out, oh, wait a minute, this is where this stuff is coming from. What do we do about it? Well, so let's give them tools so that they tend to innovate in ways that are valuable to us. So uh, 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 Valve, a, a game company, created something called Steam Workshop, which is a website full of tools that apply to games they make or support. Not general tools, but tools that apply to that. And they have the website where you can show other people what you did. So you design it, you show it to others. It increases the value to uh, Valve of their game because now the game is more interesting and all the rest of that. But in addition, Valve gets to sit there and say, oh, I see which things are downloaded more. I could commercialize that. So it's almost like this, this sort of thing of saying, well, let's connect up these two. Now, one of the things that one worries about is, well, OK, so maybe what's happening is business is capturing this. But it's very interesting. I don't know how many of you use Stata or R, the statistical software. So you use it. So Stata is a company that says, I know we get this stuff from users, statistical tests. So what I'm going to do is make a, 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 a product that has hooks on it so that you can do your tests on it. And then what I'll do is I'll take the tests that are good and I'll commercialize them and so on. But I want to keep people out of this core part of the product because that is my competitive advantage. That's my proprietary advantage. Well, enough users don't want to pay the money for R and they don't want the restrictions that R posts upon them. So that they, uh, sorry, that Stata posts upon them. So they go to R. So it's an interesting situation where it's not clear that this kind of thing as production gets less and less important in some ways, whether this kind of thing will be sustainable or whether, again, users will, will come in. Now, uh, what I'm really talking about here is a division of labor between actors in the free and producer innovation paradigms. Free innovators and producers are good at different things. And producers, as we sort of show by modeling and so on, should not do what users will do for free. You should do the stuff that your users won't do. So basically what we're talking about here is free innovators tend to be pioneers. This is a market. Why do they tend to be pioneers? They tend to be pioneers because companies do not like small and uncertain markets. When I describe to you the case of mountain biking, each time they're saying, no, 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 that's no good. What they mean is that market is small and uncertain. So what happens here is that users are coming along, and whether it's the heart-lung machine or whatever it is, they're coming along and they're building stuff. And companies look at this and they say, oh, OK, it pays for those users because they need it and they're self-rewarded. But that doesn't mean there's a market for us. So what happens is they can afford to sit there and wait for this thing to happen. And then they can come in. They can say, ah, now we understand that this is a big enough market. So in the case of, for instance, and this has been going on this part of it for a long time. In the case of the heart-lung machine, you know, a doctor came and said, look, there are patients dying all over the place. We need a heart-lung machine. And the manufacturer said, yeah, but it's going to be a big development project. And so the guy said, yeah, but my patients are dying. Yeah. So the guy worked on it for 20 years. He began to do operations with it. His name was John Hasham Given. Other, and this is how this thing worked, other surgeons came over and said, hey, you've got something that really works there. Can I see? He said, sure, come on in the operating room. And they said, wow, that really works. Can I make a copy? Yeah, sure, here's a roll of drawers. So then little companies start, somebody's technician starts to sell it to others because who wants to start from scratch all the time? This invisible piece, this pioneering piece of what is in effect a, a market curve over time 
is owned by the users, by the free innovators and also by the users. So, so that's what we're bringing into place. And uh, now, what can basically uh, user free innovators do less well? Well, it's interesting. They don't necessarily invest in diffusion because they're not getting paid to invest in diffusion. There's a market failure in a sense. So as we look at this system, it's not like it's magical and wonderful. So let me give you an example. Uh, I uh, had a tendon problem. Uh, you know, a tendon was inflamed and, and I went to the doctor and the surgeon said, what do I do? And he said, well, we could cut. I said, well, not right now. And so he said, well, in that case, wear this boot. I put on this boot. You've all seen those things, right? The ski boot giant thing. Right, so I put on this giant ski boot thing, and I tried to get out of the office, and I couldn't even move. And I said, look, you can't walk in this. I've had people play basketball in it. Yeah, but so I took it home, and I walked around, it, and it was just so clunky. So I looked at the thing, and I realized that, you know what the issue here is? They have designed one boot to immobilize everything, no matter what's wrong with you. And I just had one tendon to immobilize. So I went to the hardware store, and I built myself a, a single thing. And, and it worked fine. And I went back to the doctor, and I said, hey, doctor, look at this. Would you like to have this? He said, is it FDA approved? <laughs> and I said, no. And, and he said, well, then, no. Now, there was a case where I was perfectly willing to give it away, but I really wasn't willing to spend a ton of time and life to, 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 com you know, to commercialize, to do all the stuff that has to be done to commercialize it. So it just lay there. You know, that was sort of it. So that's what happens. What you see is many people innovate for themselves, but the next steps are not necessarily what they want to take. And so as we think about redesigning you know, systems to relate to each other, we've sort of got to figure out all these issues. We've got to figure out this thing has just become visible. We've got to figure out how to make it work. We've got to figure out whether, you know, just like we give money to um, companies for uh, uh, R&D and for subsidies and for patents and so on, we've got to figure out how, now that we know about this thing, how to support it? You know, maker spaces and all that. Why isn't a maker space as a subsidy for, for household sector innovators a good idea if, if R&D subsidies for companies are a good idea? And on this side, we've got to figure out how to do peer-to-peer -peer diffusion. So uh, I, I have a colleague, Pedro Oliveira, in, uh, in uh, uh, Portugal, and he has built a site specifically for uh, finding and publicizing medical innovations. So, so all these things, especially people with rare diseases, you know, all these things have now been, been so you put them on the web and you try to make it easier. It, do, it doesn't work very well yet, and Christiana is going to figure out a better way. Um, she really is. Um, but uh, yeah, that's where we are. Now, I wanted to show you, um, see whether we have it. See if I have it. Yeah. So, so, I wanted to show you this. You, you remember, you remember the altruism thing that I told you about. That people tell me how to do things altruistically. We can get to the point. You know, it's always been the case that well, you can give away digital copies for nothing, but it's been the case that physical stuff. No, you assume you give a design away. Everybody has to build their own pancreas or whatever it might be. But here's something kind of interesting. This is a guy, Ivan Owen, and he made these kind of giant puppet things, or maybe they're marionette things. I don't know which was which. I think it's a puppet thing, right? Uh, where, where the hand is giant, and so he built this thing where you activate the hand like this. And you'll see what it comes out to be, hands for kids without, without hands. And then what happened was, he was contacted by a guy in South Africa, a cabinet maker who just cut off half his hand with a saw. 
and said, well, can we adapt that so that I can get back hand function? And Ivan said, yeah, why not? Let's try. Nobody's paying anybody. And so somebody gave him some frequent flyer miles, and he flew off to South Africa, which is where this guy was. And they began to work together, and they began to build this thing. And what it is is a hand where you still have your wrist. So when you bend your wrist like this, the fingers do that. Okay, so, and this is a fairly, your wrist can be fairly strong, so this, so uh, they start building it, and then what happened was a lady down the street, apparently many children are born without hands, and so a lady down the street said, hey, my kid hasn't got a hand, can you maybe help him too? And they both said, yeah, sure, why not? And so Liam was his name, he began to work in their workshop, here he is here, building on this thing. And they built him one, and right away he could grasp with it. I mean, look at that happy face. I mean, just amazing. So then what happened? Then what happened was something quite interesting. Then what happened was that instead of saying, we're going to sell this, patent it, anything else, they said, let's put this stuff into a 3D printer file so that you can make it with a 3D printer. This is very important for kids because basically what happens is that you outgrow your hands as often as you outgrow your shoes when you're, when you're growing. And each of these, the only alternative in effect was a $6,000 myoelectric device. And if a kid stuck it into water, you know, the whole thing is fried and good luck. So what they did was they built this thing and they put out on the web the designs. And they recruited people, hundreds of people around the world, with 3D printers. Said, hey, if you want to make one for your kid in your neighborhood, yeah, here, here's the design. And submit back what, what you've done that you think is cool, and, and so on and so forth. So now they've morphed into all sorts of things. But the wonderful thing about it is, A, look how happy he is. B, these kids were teased in their classes. You know, I mean, the, the kids could be mean, and they were teased. And they got to choose the colors. It almost looks like a transformer or something, right? So all of a sudden, everything changed around. And all of a sudden, these kids with two hands were coming home to their parents and saying, God, couldn't you? <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I need one of those hands. And uh, Parents, as usual, be, were being obstreperous and not doing it, you know, but, but still. So it, it, here's an example of something where basically from soup to nuts, the thing is independent of producers, and this whole thing is growing stronger and stronger. Now I want to show you why it's growing stronger and stronger. You can see how my slides are totally organized. Okay, so one of the things we've done, and you'll see it, uh, and I can say in the book because it's a free book without any sense. That what, what we've done is we've sort of worked on the viability zones here. And so what you can see is if you're an individual, basically project communication cost doesn't matter to you because you're just working on your own. But project design cost does. I mean, you can only make an artificial pancreas if it's within your financial reach. Okay, so that was the sort of circumstance before the arrival of the internet. You know, generally you could not get large scale collaborations going. Then what happened was that the price of communication dropped like a stone. All of a sudden you can exchange files, you can collaborate and all the rest of this. And so basically all of a sudden you got the ability to aggregate each person's contribution and make things of really large scale like Linux, right? So this is huge. Now, companies basically are the ones who can aggregate their information. They can aggregate their costs, they can spread it over people and so on. So there is an area, it used to be the sort of the whole area where companies could when they compute the amount people are willing to pay and so on. This is the zone within which their projects are viable. What's happening today is that project communication cost is still dropping, project design cost is dropping as we all end up with uh, 
uh, digital versions of design. And so you can imagine every opportunity in the world as a spot, an innovation opportunity, and they're all migrating down and to the left. These are exogenous forces. This has nothing to do with technologies. I mean, sorry, nothing to do with policy. This is exogenous. This is because of technical advances. And so this is driving everything into this mode where it's possible for people to get together and innovate for themselves. So to summarize, and then questions, comments, whatever you like, to summarize, we are in a situation where we are seeing a different innovation system, right? We're starting to understand it. For those of you who are interested in this kind of a topic, there are only about three or four hundred of us around the world studying specifically this kind of thing. So the low-hanging fruit here and the need we have for you to do stuff is amazing relative to this thing which has been done to death for decades. So, so basically, if you're interested in research on this, any question you can ask, and when you ask questions in a minute, I will probably respond, that is such a good idea, you should research it, right? That is so cool. So it's, it's exciting, it's interesting, and, and basically uh, uh, we know it's growing in scale. It has social value. It increases social welfare. And so it's something that we can all be excited about to be in this period. So that's all I wanted to say. What would you like to say? <laughs>